Hey friends, Coach Mark and Coach Ryan here, and uh, so glad to be with you. And as we go into this time of worship and studying God's word together, I just want to share with you how excited I am. We're going to be studying one of the few passages that early on impacted my life as a young believer, and it taught me, I believe, the secret to living the Christian life from John 15. But first of all, I've asked Ryan to be here with me so that we can talk a little bit with you about generosity. I want to thank you, first of all, for your participation in giving over this last year. As you know, this is probably one of the most difficult years any of us will ever face in our lives. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity, your giving uh, to help all of the different ministries that have gone on over this last year. Talking about giving is something we like to do as a church about four times a year. And because every one of us can experience vision drift, where we just maybe lose a little bit of sight of the importance and significance of our participation and investment in this community. And so this is a chance for us to refocus and recommit ourselves to using everything we got, our time, talent, and treasure to be a part of seeing this community grow. And so Jesus also loved to constantly build the bridge and integrate what we believe with how we live. And that's also what this is about. And that's right. And let me say this. If, if you're unemployed because of the pandemic, just relax and use this as a learning tool for you for the future. But for the rest of us, uh, what we do with our mouth, our words, our thoughts, uh, our actions are all part of our discipleship of following Jesus Christ. And that includes my wallet. In the Old Testament, what it included was giving 10% of the crop, 10% of whatever you did in your trade. It was called tithing. And God says, bring forth the full tithe. Jesus refers to this again in the New Testament when he's talking about how we treat other people. And he says, you need to not only tithe, but also be considerate about how you're treating other people. The big idea is that even our wallet is a part of our life. So if you have never given, particularly 10% of your salary, it seems like a huge amount, a huge chunk. So where do I begin? Well, I actually experienced that as a new believer and I saw my dad go through that as a 45 year old man deciding as a businessman that this is what I was going to do. But for you, it might mean starting out with 2% or deciding I'm gonna start out with 4% and go up 1% per year. But the idea is that what you and I make in our living is also a part of extending God's kingdom. Yeah, we really believe that giving is not just about fulfilling some of the practical financial needs that we have as a community to fulfill our mission. It's also about each one of us being apprenticed into Jesus's spirit of generosity, becoming like the Father in his generous heart. And I remember when I was a new believer and I got my first paycheck working with InterVarsity and the joy I felt when I started to give some of that money back to God for his kingdom purposes. There was, number one, a sense of surrender and submission that I was giving to God. I was really, I really felt like this was a tangible expression of my trust in God with my resources. And believe me, in those days with that paycheck, I, I needed every dollar. But I always saw God so faithful to take care of every one of my needs as I was trusting him with my resources. Number two, there was a joy in my heart knowing that I was giving to what God was doing. There's just a joy as we become more and more a part of God's character. As the Bible says, it's better to give than to receive. And I was experiencing that. And then thirdly, stewarding, knowing that I was giving some of my money to be a part of God's mission, not just my time, but also my resources brought me a lot of excitement. And Ryan, I like that part, the fact that we do it together. Uh, it's a sense of team. It's not me as Han Solo or you as an individual, but it's us bringing our resources together as a team to advance the kingdom of God. So go team. Thank you 
for 2020 and your giving. And as we go into 2021, let's continue to pray and ask God what he would have me give as you and I together as a team advance the kingdom of God. Now, as we go into this service, let me take a moment to pray. Father, thank you that you are God. It is you who has made us and not we ourselves. We are your people, your sheep, and the sheep of your pasture. And now, Lord, we ask that you would continue to provide for all of us and that you would continue to provide for all of the missions that are going forth in and outside of this church. And now, God, we would ask you to speak to us individually in our hearts and change our lives as we worship you and with the power of your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Your 
Yeah. 
love so strong God is the ruler yeah. This is my Father's world Why should my heart be sad The Lord is King Let the head Wonderful to be with you, church. Thank you so much for joining us online. My name is Joseph. This is Crystal. We've got a couple of announcements for you. And my first is just a reminder that every weekend we are gathering for three services outdoors right now, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 5 p.m. And my second announcement is you may have heard, and the rumors are true, that we have reopened children's ministry. You do need to pre-register. Registration opens on Sunday for the following weekend. So if you'd like to get your kids plugged in and come and join us, please do that at the 9 a.m. service. And my last announcement is that our fearless leader, Mark Foreman, throughout the month of February has been releasing 12 tips for surviving disruptive times. So if you haven't got those, if you're not already following us on social media or subscribe to his email, just head over to our website and hit the subscribe button there so you can get that and a bunch of information about what's going on here at your church. Hey, church fam and bottom line community. We are back with our next business mixer, February 28th at 1045 a.m. in the auditorium here on campus, but we will be socially distanced. The topic is going to be the war on good mental health, social distancing, COVID, masks, and media. And this is all going to be covered by our dear friend, Dr. Chip Taylor. Those of you who have been with us before know Dr. Chip Taylor likes to bring it. And we as working professionals can meet together, get in a good headspace, and figure out our goals, our dreams, and our visions for our communities as well as our businesses. So come on the 28th. It's going to be, as I always say, epic. Uh, our high school students are epic as well. In fact, they are legendary and we all know they are the future, but more importantly, they are impacting our communities right now. And it is fantastic to see these young adults transforming their communities, learning to lead, being confident and sharing the gospel and discipling their friends and their family. And we get to witness all of this through our Vox ministry. And it's happening in the middle of the week. It's happening on Sunday services. Uh, we do small groups and eventually we're going to get to go back to camp. So many ways that our high school students are impacting our community, but we need more leaders. And I know some of you just got that little tingling in your heart. Like I could mentor someone. I love our high school students. I want to be a part of this. If that is something that you feel you're calling to do, Go ahead and email Vox, V-O-X, at northcoastcalvary.org. Or if you forgot everything I just said, as always, or what Joseph said, you can check it out on our website. We'll see you next time, church. Our next act of worship is an invitation to participate by giving. Giving is an act of faith and trust, joyfully responding to God through our financial offerings and a regular tithe. 
Worshiping in this way can be an intentional act of gratitude in response to God's abundant provision in our lives. Giving is a concrete way we collaborate with God to impact our global partners and local community with initiatives that seek the common good, share the good news, and promote flourishing. Join me now in praying for God's blessing on these tithes and offerings, and then I'd invite you to pause the service and participate through either texting to give at the number on the screen or giving through our website. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for all the ways you sustain and provide for us. The world is alive with your generosity and abundance. Let our lives in word and deed bring you honor as we join you in blessing the world around us, sharing our resources with the poor and marginalized, seeking the lost, and binding up the brokenhearted. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, North Coast family. It's such a great honor to be here today with you. I am a member of our church. My name is Gloria Banks, and I'd like to share with you about an American hero of faith. This is actually a African-American woman who lived in the 19th century. And this was a time when our nation wrestled to determine whether slavery would continue to exist in America. Her name is Mrs. Harriet Tubman, also known as the Black Moses, born into slavery in 1822. She overcame each and every battle that she faced, even being tragically beaten as a child slave because she believed that God would make a way out of no way to rescue her, no matter how grave her circumstances. I'll share with you very quickly just three areas that I thought were instrumental or momentous in her life. One, she was the leader or conductor of the Underground Railroad. As the conductor of this railroad, she single-handedly rescued the largest and most successful mission to transport over 100 slaves to free um, Northern American states, even as far as into Canada. As the conductor of this railroad system, she made over 13 round trips, walking over a thousand miles. And she never lost one passenger. Every trip ended on the other side of slavery into freedom. Now she attributed her success to God's intervention every step of the way. She also used underground anti-slavery supporters, consisting of both black and white abolitionists. The Underground Railroad was not really a traditional running railroad, but it was a secret collection of safe houses and hidden passages scattered around and about dirt roads and hills and dangerous waterways that were interspersed between cities and small towns. The underground train connections were made by using secret communications, vocalized animal calls, secret spying codes, and religious songs such as Go Down Moses and Bound for the Promised Land. The next thing is that you, you may not have known, but she served in the Civil War. She worked as a Civil War cook and a nurse, which she later received benefits for. She further served in direct combat as a secret spy across enemy lines. Tubman also became the first woman to ever lead a Union troop surprise attack on Confederate soldiers during the Civil War. Lastly, I wanted to share about how she endured pain and suffering. As a young child, she worked under her slave master's command she um, encountered very serious injuries from beatings that left her with periodic seizures, headaches, and tremors until her death at 92. She never complained about her illnesses or her pain, nor did she compromise God's work due to the physical pains suffered in her own life. 
Her journey is very reminiscent of Moses of the Old Testament, another of God's chosen vessels to lead God's people. Moses was the conductor of the Israelites as they exited out from under 430 years of bondage, of harsh slavery under the Egyptian rule by King Pharaoh. And you can find this in Exodus in the Bible. Well, I'm done for now, but I thank you for this opportunity to share just a few of the neat things about Harriet Tubman's life. For me, preparing this has really encouraged me to continue serving and loving God in all of the areas of my life, especially those areas that are most challenging. As my grandmother often reminded me, if God is for you, Gloria, who can be against you? God bless you and enjoy the rest of your day. Here's the question that Jesus is answering for us today. How does the Christian life work? Not what do we believe, but how does this Christian life work? I don't know if you've ever played golf, but I remember the first time I played with a semi-pro. It destroyed me. It destroyed my game. Here's how it went. Mark, I'm noticing how you're swinging the club. I want you to keep your head down. That's right. And I want you to keep your knees slightly bent. No, more. No, not that much. I want you to have your left arm straight. I want you to just imagine you have a, a newspaper tucked in the armpit of your left arm. And I want you to swing easy, but I want you to accelerate as you come out of the swing. Now, I want you to keep your stance natural, not too far apart, not, no, 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 not too close. Now, be careful, don't rock forward on your toes, don't rock back on your heels, and keep your swing natural. Keep it straight, transferring, though, the weight from your back foot to your left foot. And I want you to hold the club loosely, gently, oh no, not that loose. And now that you've done all 17 of these things, I want you to just relax destroyed my golf game. That's how we feel sometimes of what it means to be a Christian. How does this work? And so Jesus gives us a very simple picture that changed my life. It's the allegory of the vine. Listen to his words. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will bear even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So in this allegory, Jesus begins by telling us that he is the true vine. Israel, throughout the Old Testament, is called the vine. In fact, the clearest picture is in Isaiah 5, where God is the gardener, and he, and he buys the land, and he plants the vineyard, and he's expecting fruit to come out of this vine, which is Israel. In fact, on their coins in the first century, an Is Israelite coin had the vine on it. Over the gate of the temple, it had the vine. So Israel was the symbol, the vine was the symbol of Israel. What's striking here is he doesn't say, now in the New Testament, the church is the vine. He never says, you are the vine, that I am the vine. Instead, he says, he is the true vine, meaning he is the fulfillment of what Israel could not be and do. 
He's the consummate Israelite who is the fulfillment of what God expected from Israel. And so as we plug ourselves into him, the fulfillment that was expected through Israel actually comes through Jesus, the Messiah, the consummate Israelite. So he's not just the ideal vine. He is the reliable, faithful, consummate vine. Now, right out of the gate, there's a great lesson here. He's telling you, stop trying, stop attempting, stop striving, but rather plug in to Jesus as the true vine. The second part of the allegory is the father is the gardener. Now, we think of gardeners mostly as pruning flowers and keeping up suburban yards, but it might be helpful for you to think of a farmer, someone who's raising vineyards. And he says here about the gardener that his father is the one who's taking care of the garden. And what does a farmer look for? A gardener looks just to a, for a pretty yard, but a farmer is looking for produce. He's looking for fruit. And God is the fruit picker. That's what he's looking for in your life and my life. And he adds here that he prunes and cuts so that we might produce more fruit. He doesn't get to us in the allegory till verse 5, where he calls us the branches. Isn't that striking? We always want to know, where am I in the story? Where am I? And in, you're all the way down in verse 5, not in verse 1. And he says, we are not the fruit, and we are not the vine, but we are merely the branch. So this is a picture of Christ's loving nature coming through us, the branch, to ultimately bear fruit. And the fruit in this story is evangelism, so other people might know the love of Christ. Jesus is going to define it as prayer that's answered is very much fruit, but it's also the fruit of the Spirit, the character that begins to happen in my life. So here's a living picture of how the Christian life begins to work. It's fruit that God's looking for. And Jesus had said in chapter 7 of verse, of verse 16, chapter 7 of Matthew, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So this isn't extra credit. This is critical. So this abiding life that Jesus is describing for us is really, really important. Go back to verse 4, where we read that the goal of the branch in relationship to the vine is to remain in me and I remain in you. Apart from him, we cannot bear fruit, he says. So therefore, and he repeats the word again, remain in me. This is a key term that I've spoken about before. Here's some uh, history you may not know. This word meno, it's, it's a Greek word, but the, the Hebrew complement to this is a technical term that the rabbis used over and over. And in fact, it's, it's written when 10 rabbis sit together and occupy themselves with the Torah, the Shekinah glory abides, menen, meno, among them. It's living among them. So when Jesus would use this term as a Hebrew rabbi, the ears of the rabbis would pick up because they would understand that term. And John specifically uses that term in his gospel 41 times. Remember, the disciples came to Jesus and says, where are you abiding, menen? Where are you living? And then here, he uses the term over and over again. And we referred to it back in chapter 14, where John says in verse 2, in my father's house are many abiding places. 
And he says in verse 21 and verse 23 that we will make our home with you. So this is not a unique passage separate from all these other passages, but it's now telling us how the whole thing of abiding in Christ happens. Andrew Murray, in his great devotional book, talks about this very thing for you and me. It's this living connection. It's this homing. It's this dependency and relationship that we have with Christ that begins to produce fruit. So we're not confusing our roles here. We're not the primary source. The vine is. And we are not the fruit, as beautiful and as good-looking as you are, you are, not the, you are not the fruit. We are the ones through whom the life passes to produce the fruit. And we can't do it without him. He says in the passage, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we find ourselves realizing this kind of spirituality is dependency on him. So many self-help books are built around self-reliance and self-effort and self-confidence, and even many of our religions are built around achievement and checking the box. And, and, and even in, among our Eastern friends, there's the discovery of the God in me. And the more I discover the God in me, the more I realize that I am divine, just as you are. Rather than abandoning self, surrendering to the source who is God and letting his life flow through me to produce this fruit. So this is not mere religion and it's not even mere doctrine. It's a life that Jesus is describing for you and me. Growing up, my grandfather had a half acre of lemon uh, trees in his backyard. So it was, a, it was a lemon grove. And every year, uh, Sunkist would come through with their pickers and pick uh, the lemons, and they would come through at other times of year and prune the trees and so forth. And uh, over the years, Sunkist decided that he, they couldn't be bothered with small growers like my grandfather. So um, they moved on to these larger groves, and my grandfather's grove began to go, uh, you know, the way the, of all trees that aren't pruned and taken care of. But I would see my grandfather coming up out of, uh, it was down the hill, so he'd be coming up out of the grove, and he'd always have a smile on his face. And I, I would go down and watch him cultivate. I would watch him irrigate. I would watch him prune. I would watch him harvest. And what a picture of God. God coming into his garden with all these believers and picking the fruit and with a big smile on his face because that's what pleases the Father. But now let's talk about the dark side of this, which is pruning. You're still there, right? Okay. In verse 2, going back there, he says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, uh, he prunes, so that, with the result that, it will be even more fruitful. Then he uses a different term, then pruning, he says to his disciples, you are already clean, which is letting us know th the operation of pruning is actually to clean up our lives, to change us, to transform us. Why or how? Because of the word I have spoken to you. So he says, now remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And then jumping down in verse 6, if anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burnt. If you remain in me, then my words will remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. And this is what makes my Father happy to his glory, that you bear much fruit. So this abiding life in Christ uh, has 
perhaps a painful side to it, and at least a change and transforming side to it, where he tells us that he cuts off the branches that don't bear fruit. Back in Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, Jesus said, the ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So pruning is necessary. Those of you that work in your own garden, you know how it works. You obviously cut off the dead twigs and branches uh, that don't bear fruit, but you also learn to prune what I would call the mutant green growth that's not going to produce blooms, it's not going to produce uh, any fruit, and, and it's a cluster of, of green that's just going crazy, and so you have to to prune that back because it's a waste of energy in the plant. Now, how does that apply to you and me? Well, from the moment you become a believer, you discover Christ pruning action. He starts pruning our attitudes. He starts checking what we do with our time, how we speak to others, our character, and so forth. Leon Morris, famous scholar, writing on this very passage, says, the fruit of, a, of Christian service is never the result of allowing the natural energies and inclinations to run riot. And this is probably counter to some of the things you've even heard taught in the church. A lot of times, because we as church leaders, we want everybody to like us, to love us. We, we say to you, what have you ever wanted to do? What are your dreams? What do you like to do? Go do that. What do you like to say? Go do that. What do you like to think? Go do that. What's your image? What's your color? And it, it's really a lot of secular humanism that we're throwing at you, saying just be whatever you want to be. But that's really not the Christian message. The Christian message is to become who God has created you to be. And so even though we do get to do a lot of the things that we do love because God created us that way, we love music or we love art or we love guacamole, all of that's fine, but there's certain things in us that aren't good. And God comes to prune those things. And it's called hearing and obeying. And that's why Jesus keeps saying, my word, if you keep my word or if you obey my word, it's the word of God that does the pruning, both as you read the Bible, but as the Holy Spirit also brings the word to your heart. It's God pruning us so that we might bear more fruit and actually become the person that he's called us to be. Remember last time when we were talking about this intimacy that we have with Christ, where he comes and makes his home with us, in John 14, 21, he says, whoever obeys, we will come and show our love to him. In John 14, 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching and we will come to them and make our home with him. So how does this pruning work? Well, I think for most people, this pruning starts out kind of light. God might come to you and says, hey, clean up your French. I, well, I don't like that language. Or I don't like the way you talk to people. And, and you begin to create, correct these things. Or what if you begin to include some things in your life, like every day, reading a little bit of the Bible and praying and attending church. And so these are small little prunings that begin to happen in our life. And then he goes deeper and he begins to deal with our character. You're not so patient, Mark. Let me help you with your impatience. You're not very gentle. You're kind of gruff in how you treat people that God himself is gentle. Mark, why do you feel the need to be darn right and judgmental? Let me help. You can see these character issues that he begins to deal with our lives in. But ultimately, even for people that have walked with Christ for decades, 
he begins to deal with, I think, the deepest things in our lives, the wounds, the hurts. And oftentimes, these are parallel to things that maybe therapists and psychologists are trying to help with, wounds even from our childhood that have caused us to begin to live our lives a certain way in defense mechanisms, covering these things up. But the wound, as my son sang once, the wound is where the light shines through. And often God wants to get even to those deep areas in our lives, even more profoundly than a therapist could, uh, and actually ask us to change. And we may say, oh, I can never change that part of my life, or I can never let God touch that area of my life. That's just who I am. That's just the way I am. That's just the way everybody in my family. No, God is calling you and I to bear fruit and to become like him. And pruning is a part of that. So now let's talk about the best part, the fruit. As we abide in Christ, Jesus says we begin to produce lasting fruit. Check out verse 5 again. He will bear much fruit. Verse 8, this is to my Father's glory, meaning this is what makes him happy, that you bear much fruit, proving to be my disciples. So how do I know who's a Christian and who isn't? Well, yeah, those that say they are. But Jesus says it's actually evidenced through life change, that I begin to live existing for God, not he for me. I'm plugging my life into him. And as, as his life flows through me, he begins to change me, and it flows out the other side, producing fruit, and that makes God happy. In verse 7, Jesus tells us, one of the ways that you and I will bear fruit. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Wow. Whatever I wish, well, in keeping with the will of God because God's life is beginning to throw, flow through me. I begin to want what he wants, but what joy to think that we can actually change the world through prayer. What if, what if more things are changed through you, through prayer, than ever will be changed through opinion or through words and dialogue or even through action? It's that dependency on God that's a part of the fruit that he's asking for us. But it's not just prayer. I want you to jump down with me to verse 9. He tells us now about the fruit of love. Here he breaks away from the allegory of the vine to just talk to us about the relationship of love. He says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, and now abide, remain, make your home in my love. What a beautiful picture that your home is in God's love. How do we remain in his love? He answers it, if you keep my commands, the easy ones and the hard ones, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. And I haven't told you this, he says, to make it hard for you. In verse 11, he says, I've told you this so that your joy, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So allowing Christ's love to flow through us to produce fruit causes us to experience extreme joy, the kind of thing that makes us say, this is what I was made for. This is what it means to be made in the image of God. Now here it is. You might ask yourself, okay, so it's all about keeping his commands. How is this different than the Old Testament? Well, great question. The first thing is to realize that we're not just obeying him in my own strength. He is flowing through me to obey him. 
But the second thing is to realize is that he's going to have us focus on the greatest command of all. Love one another as I have loved you. So he says in verse 12, and this is my command, meaning in case you are wondering what I'm going to pulsate to you as my command and say, Mark, Mark, uh, 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 I want you to love that person. Mark, uh, 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 I want you to love that person. It's often going to be love these people as I have loved you. Ah, oh, how has he loved me? He's been so patient. He, could have, he, he hasn't judged me. He could have snuffed me out and judged me and sent me to hell. That's not what he's done. He's loved me. In fact, he's given his life for me. So he's been patient. He's been kind. He's been gentle. He's been uh, forbearing, bending over backwards for me. Uh, he's, he's been that God that I've needed. And now he's saying, Mark, now go and be that to the people around you. And, and, and how does he love me? Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. So yeah, my love becomes sacrificial as I meditate on God's sacrificial love for me and the cycle is complete. Wow. Now here's my assignment for you this week. Soak in this passage. Just soak in it. Remember, he says, if you remain in me, make, my, make your home in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Fabulous. But remember this, apart from me, you can't do it. It's how the Christian life works. So as we close here, you may be looking at your own life and instead of feeling inspired, you're feeling overwhelming because you, you thought it was just all about performance or you thought it was all about checking all the right doctrines. And now you're realizing, wow, it's a living organism where God's life flows through me and fruit is to be coming out of me. And I look at the, the branch that I am and I see just a little raisin popping out a dry, withered raisin at the end of my branch. And it can be discouraging to realize I have not been the fruitful person that I want to be. Here's my advice to you. Don't try harder. Don't try performing more. And certainly don't try embracing yourself more, saying, you really are wonderful. Don't listen to that sermon. You really are divine. The spark of God is in you. This is where we need to go. We need to go back to a simple relationship with Jesus. He's the vine. Plug in. You're the branch. And you will bear much fruit. And the secret to abiding in Jesus is obeying. And another word for that is surrender. Allow him. Surrender to his truth and his word. And particularly surrender to his love for you. And now love others the way Christ has loved you. Let's pray. Father, thank you this day for the truth of your word. In fact, indeed, it is truth. And thank you for the clear picture of the vine and the branch and the gardener and the pruning and the fruit. And God, how we pray that you would give us courage to surrender to you and to obey you, particularly when it's hard to obey, and that we would obey the ultimate command, which is to love others as you have loved us, and in so doing, that we would bear much fruit. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.
my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all. Bless your name, you are my all in all. And when I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Now may God give you and me the courage to surrender to his love, to face off as a branch to a vine and say, I give up, I give in, I surrender to your love. You know best. Lead me and guide me and let your life flow through me and give me the courage to obey you in the hard times, which are usually to love other people that I'm finding at the time unlovable. God, give us this courage to surrender to your love and love others in Jesus' name. Amen.